morning, everybody, and uh, thanks very much for this opportunity to speak. We're in dot scale, so I'm here with a story of scale. Uh, it's a story of a community with a pretty heavy-duty computing challenge, uh, but also some rather particular constraints, which force it to explore one of the less usual dimensions in scale. Uh, so I hope this will be of interest to you. Uh, the community is the high-energy physics community. You probably worked that out. The, the computing challenge is the computing for the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And the solution that we're going to discuss is called WLCG, the Worldwide Large Hadron Collider Computing Grid. Uh, and it's the, it's the platform that was behind, for example, the, uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012 that uh, you, may have, you may have followed. So, Fine, we have a big computing challenge. Uh, we need about 400,000 of these. We need about 300,000 of these. That's a one terabyte disk, by the way. Uh, and we need a bunch of this. But so far, fine. But uh, what's, what's, what's the particularity that we're here to discuss? Uh, basically, need, means that we need one of these, no? Uh, well, we do have one of these. This is indeed the CERN Computing Center. But actually, the platform that we're going to discuss looks like this. The takeaways here are, well, it's a kind of global level thing. Here you can see nodes and lines. The nodes are all computer centers, actually. They're computer centers which are attached to universities or to research institutes. Uh, the lines are interactions, inevitably, typically data transfer. And the other thing to know is that we, we dream the distributed computing dream which is that we, we hope that this uh, complexity isn't visible to our users. With that context, here's, here's the plan of action for the next 15 minutes. Um, explain a bit about why we need so much computing. We explain a bit about why we do it like that, and then go into a bit of detail about how it all works. So just to step back a little bit, uh, this is a schematic of the, of the Large Hadron Collider. It's a tunnel underground, uh, 100 meters underground, 27 kilometer tunnel. And uh, here, protons are collided near the speed of light. And they, they, at these collision points, there are four of them, there are four large detectors, uh, CMS, LHCB, Atlas, and ALICE. And these are large international collaborations. And they, they detect what goes on in these, uh, in these collisions. Now, um, the thing to notice is that uh, although these collisions happen and all sorts of crazy stuff is produced, uh, it disappears in a fraction of a second. And the only persistent output is, um, is the data. And so this is the data that represents this multi-billion franc, multi-billion dollar investment. So it's our job to, to exploit it and make it available. Here's a close-up of one of these detectors. This is Atlas. Um, this is to help give you an idea of the, of the data volumes. This is 7,000 tons of detector, and its sole purpose is to extract as much data as possible from these collisions and send it to us, so to speak. Um, and it does this 40 million times per second. So even with, uh, even with some heavy-duty filtering, in fact, Atlas and all these experiments have their own computer centers dedicated to them, which throw away 99.99% of the events. Uh, even with this filtering, it will still fill up multiple 10 gigabit links uh, into the CERN computer center. Again, to, to help you understand why we have a data problem, if you look at the picture in the middle at the top, this is one of the, this is one of the collisions. The first thing to mention is it's, it's relatively messy, and in fact, what typically happens is 25 or 30 of these collisions happen at the same time. And a great deal of our CPU is spent disentangling these and turning raw meter readings from the detector into, into physics. Um, the other thing to mention is that to do this discovery, you have to compare theory and experiment. So this is the experiment, but what's the theory? This is represented by simulation, and you simulate the detector, and then you compare what you really see. And the, the other half, so to speak, of what our infrastructure is doing, it's this simulation of the detectors. Finally, I'll mention that uh, high energy physics, it's, uh, it's a statistics game. So it's not like discovering a, a rare bird or something. You can wait a long time in the right place and you see one. Uh, it's, it's a kind of statistical thing. You accumulate millions, billions, trillions of events, and a statistical picture emerges. 
This means uh, there's no such thing as too many collisions. This means more collisions is more physics. This means, for us, more collisions is more data, more CPU, more network, which brings us here. Where do we get it from? Now, here are some diagrams of the, the resources pledged uh, to us. CPU, tape indeed, because we have a, a very serious data preservation and archiving activity, and disk. Th these are broken down by computer center. And the point here is that although high energy physics is a global community, high energy physics funding is not. And uh, this means that any particular country, while they are not willing to build an extension to the CERN computer center, they are willing to build an extension to one of their own computer centers. Uh, and this is precisely what you see here. And uh, so we deal with integrating around 150 computer centers worth of CPU disk um, into a single resource and present that as the platform for LHC computing. And that brings us back here. So, we have a bunch of CPU, a bunch of disk, and a bunch of network. Now what I want to do is uh, go into a bit more detail about the services, which the technology underneath, which we use to make these things available. And we're going to start uh, with the network, essentially. So in fact, the, the data movement, the file transfer. And we have a file transfer service. We call it the FTS. Uh, and what I thought I would do is throw up a, uh, a command line invocation of a transfer and take you through it so you can understand a bit about what's going on. Of course, if you're going to do this a million times a day, you use the API. But uh, this is a nice uh, little representation. So here we go. FTS transfer submit. Please move this file from A to B. Minus K. This is already going to the heart of, uh, of, of, of the FTS because this means compare checksums. And if you're, if you're going to transfer several hundred terabytes a day, you're going to lose bits. And uh, this, th th this means reliable file transfer. FTS will do rescheduling of transfers, retries, validation. It will compare the checksums and make sure that the, the, the transfer has worked. Delegation ID. If you ask a file transfer service to do something on your behalf, and you want it done asynchronously, you walk away, you come back, uh, and it's all done, you have to delegate it some kind of credential to operate on your behalf. Our infrastructure is based on X509, public key. And what we do here, what the client is doing here, is creating uh, a proxy, so a short-lived self-signed certificate, which is delegated to the file transfer service to operate on its behalf. Next, minus S, this is the FTS endpoint. Pure and simple as a REST interface there that you can interact with. The final thing I want to mention is we have the, the source and the destination. So um, you can see GSI FTP there. This is Grid FTP, which some of you may know. Um, this is really a foundational technology for us. It gives us two things. First of all, it supports uh, this X509 infrastructure that we require. And second, it does third-party transfer. So you can be in a situation where the the client is in Oxford, the FTS server is in Geneva, the data source is in New York, and the destination is Melbourne or something. And uh, of course, you want the data to go directly from source to destination and not go through any of these other actors. So GridFTP gives us this, uh, this third-party transfer as well. Now, once you've submitted this, it will be joined, uh, it will be put in a queue uh, along with uh, all the other thousands potentially of transfers between the same two points. And the FTS will go to work, and it will, it will implement a, a logic a bit like this. So it will, it will start a bunch of transfers between, any, between the two points involved, and it will check the success rate. This is the orange line success rate. And as long as success rate is fine, the blue line shows you that the FTS starts pushing more and more. It tries to instantiate more and more transfers. When success rate goes below 100%, FTS backs off in an extremely familiar fashion, backs off, and then it starts to push again once uh, stability is resumed. Um, and this is the way we managed to fill the infrastructure. And I think it illustrates some nice principles or lessons that we've learned about managing this kind of thing. Uh, first of all, it's the, what you could call the principle of 
local autonomy in distributed systems, which includes the, the right to fail and the right not to do what you are supposed to do and the right to be unreliable. Um, and the right, so you will always be disappointed somehow by your infrastructure, and so you have to be adaptive and not prescriptive about how you, how you interact with it. And this gives you a number of advantages. It gives you stability in your service, of course. It makes it easier for you to incorporate new resources because you're not being picky. And it allows you to expand to capacity where possible. And this is the other observation I would make, is that we're a, we're a throughput business. Um, FTS, apart from making transfers efficient, it doesn't try to make any individual transfer incredibly fast. Because when you're operating at capacity, this would happen purely at the expense of another transfer. And so your throughput isn't increased. So the other, the other sort of lesson is about, optim for us, is optimizing for throughput and optimizing at the level of the service and not at the individual components. Similar logic can be applied to compute, where we now turn. You have 150 sites. This means 150 batch systems. So if you want to schedule a job, how do you know where to schedule it? How do you know the state of all these batch systems with sufficient uh, accuracy? How do you know what resource you're going to get? How do you know, critically, how long it's going to take? Uh, the, the answer is you don't really know in, in good enough detail. And uh, if you try to just build a scheduler on top of this, you get into trouble because you're allocating work before you have been allocated resources. So somehow, to make this work, you have to turn job assignment into resource allocation. And this is what we do through the, a system of pilot jobs. It's a level of indirection, essentially. So you can see our users there are submitting red jobs to a single task queue. These are not submitted to batch systems directly. There's a separate system which is uh, submitting what we call pilot jobs, a blue shell. And as, as resources come available in all these 150 batch systems, they are populated by these blue shells, these pilot jobs. These jobs call home, and they explain the detail of their environment. And this means that the task queue has an instantaneously accurate view of all the resources available to it, and it can behave like a regular scheduler thereafter. And this has been the key. And again, it's the principle of not making assumptions about your infrastructure, letting it tell you what kind of state it's in. Uh, and this has given us a stable service, but it's also allowed us to start incorporating all kinds of new things, such as volunteer computing, um, such as cloud computing, and even uh, HPC, even supercomputing centers. And uh, here, here is a, a nice uh, illustration of, of this in, in, in practice, because what you see here along the, the x-axis is simply time, and the y-axis is jobs running. This is the Atlas experiment. You can see a couple of hundred thousand jobs running simultaneously. And here they're broken down by task. They're broken down by uh, the fact that it's analysis or it's simulation or something like this. And the, the, the point to take away, the dog that didn't bark here, is simply that the infrastructure is invisible. So the, the abstraction has, has worked effectively uh, in this case. So finally, um, I would like to talk about the storage aspect. Here's, we're back to our pie chart of, the, of how the storage is, is given to WLCG. And you see the, a large wedge there. That, that wedge is CERN. And so uh, what, what storage system is it running at CERN which is providing this? This is something like 60 petabytes of disk. The answer is a storage system called EOS, which was developed at CERN based on a, a framework called XRUD from Slack. And it has, a, it has a, I guess, familiar architecture in that it has a, a head node, which does the metadata. Uh, it has the namespace. It will do authentication, authorization. And it will then pass clients directly to any of thousands of disk servers to do I.O. directly. So here's a, a monitoring slide from, from EOS. And you can see that. It has 135 petabytes in there. This is raw capacity, and for, for various reasons, we actually do, we replicate everything twice. So that's why we're at 65 or so available. And it's supporting an interaction rate in this moment of uh, 500,000 uh, IOPS. And this, this was the point of EOS. It was to be able to provide the, the necessary storage to enable the large computing farm that we have at CERN. Um, and how did it do this? Well. 
It does it with uh, an, uh, putting the namespace completely in memory. So this has allowed us to scale adequately in size, and it gives us all the IOPS that we can eat, basically. Um, and this has allowed a large, a very high throughput operation to happen uh, in the CERN computer center. But there's a price to pay, of course, if you want to put everything in RAM, you have to, you have to deal with your persistency. And what EOS does is to write all the changes to a journal, and when it boots, then this journal has to be read. And this can take 20 minutes or even 40 minutes, depending on the size of the namespace. So while in certain applications this wouldn't be acceptable, for us, uh, being throughput oriented, this, this is definitely a worthwhile design compromise because uh, on, on the scale, if you do the accounting over a year, the fact that this has enabled such a vast throughput of physics in the computer center vastly outweighs the fact that occasionally we have to, we have to encounter this problem. So another illustration of optimizing for throughput and making, uh, making the right design compromises. That completes our tour of the infrastructure so far. I just want to mention a bit about the future. These, these things, these accelerators take a long time to build. Um, and uh, you can see the second line is LHC. So we're doing physics now. There is an upgrade happening, which will take us to high luminosity LHC. This will give us 10 times more collisions, which means more than 10 times more data. And because these collisions will be, be more complex and there's a nonlinear uh, relation between the complexity and the CPU, this will mean something more like 50 times more CPU. So the fun definitely doesn't end here. And if you look even further ahead, because it takes something like 25 years to put together a project like this, there's even a future collider which is currently conceived as a 100 kilometer ring around, uh, around the France and, and Geneva. And, and so I think this I mean, who knows what, these, what the, the data and CPU requirements will be there. So this is just to say um, the, fun, the fun definitely hasn't ended yet. And I think the, uh, the, the high energy physics community will be having adventures in scale for, uh, for many years to come. Thank you.